Hi, welcome to Stat Stuff. I'm Matt Hansen. In this lesson, we'll discuss what I call the ABC model that explores how we can think so that we can understand the risks and evidence behind our decisions and how to influence others. There are no prerequisites for this lesson, so we'll begin by defining what is the ABC model. Well, the ABC model refers to the analysis of behavior and cognition model. So what does that mean? Well, the model explores the phrase ideas of consequences and it looks at it in such a way to understand how we think that is like absorbing and assessing information internally in our minds and how that way we think influences our external behavior. So it helps us to also understand the assumptions that we're making that could significantly affect how we do data analysis. So let's go over an overview of what the ABC model looks like. It could be said there are three internal layers, that is arguments that lead to beliefs that could lead to conclusions. And then those may lead to three external layers, which are actions, behaviors, and consequences. Again, each of these being ABC and ABC is an easy way to remember these different layers. When we say internal layers, what we're saying is these are the layers where that are affected in our thought processes. There's something that's not visible to others. They're internal to us and how we think. External refers to the things that other people can see, the outward actions or some of those things that are visible by other people externally. So these layers, they kind of illustrate a natural order of how things could flow. So that is, each layer is dependent on the previous layer. That is, when you have actions, kind of like in dominoes that are being tipped here, these actions are only being tipped only because they were tipped by these prior three layers, conclusions that were tipped by beliefs and tipped by arguments. But at the same rate, that doesn't necessarily mean a subsequent layer is going to be triggered. That is, just because you might have these conclusions that are triggered here doesn't necessarily mean it's going to lead to certain actions or that actions will lead to behaviors and so on. So a person's actions may indicate their beliefs and their arguments that influence those beliefs. And we're going to split, explore that a little bit further as we dig into the explanation of the ABC model. It can be somewhat difficult to explain the various aspects of the ABC model, so we'll show now an overview of the entire model and describe it by working backwards through the model. Well, to help it explain the ABC model, I'm going to use an overview here using the example of constructing a building. And what we're going to start with is kind of go backwards into the, the process in describing it, and then we're going to go into all the details, and then we'll come back here and revisit again. So here's kind of like an overview of what the model might look like as illustrated through this example we're about to go over, where we're going to start just as we did before in understanding the behaviors and consequences, then work backwards through these six different stages on here, and then we'll wrap it all back up together in the end. So again, to help illustrate this, we're going to use this as an example for like, constructing a three-story building. So we're going to say this as we showed earlier. These are the six different layers all together. There's three ABC internal layers and the three ABC external layers. Well, if we use the example of constructing a three-story building like this, we can say the first layers, the internal layers, kind of like serve as the foundation for the building. Just like a foundation for a building is typically invisible from above ground, it's something that's underground. In this way, the foundation is kind of like what's invisible to others, that is these internal attributes for the ABC model. And then built on top of that, the parts that are visible are the external layers, kind of like if there were a three-story building here. Again, we can see this above ground, just like we can see these last three attributes here, the ABC model, the actions, behaviors, and consequences, which tend to be something that is visible and externally visible by others. So let's walk through a couple examples of what we mean by some of these things right here. So for the first example, let's say that we have a consequence where the consequence is a thief is caught robbing a jewelry store. So what may have been the conclusions for the thief? That is, we might see the consequence on the external side that a thief is caught robbing the jewelry store. Now even though we cannot see the conclusions, we can't see the foundation that eventually led to the consequences, we can make some reasonable assumptions about what those conclusions were the thief came to. So in this case, if a thief is caught robbing a jewelry store, that's the consequence that they're suffering, we can probably reasonably conclude that, that they must have thought they can get away with it. If they didn't think that they could get away with it and made the decision that they're going to go for it because they believe they can get away with it, then they would have never taken the action and led to the behavior and eventually suffer the consequences that are visible to us. So that seems like the, the way we might explore this. Another example would be a consequence where someone is winning $10 million in the lottery. Well, what may have been the conclusions for a person like that? 
Well, the consequences, for example, don't have to be something that's negative. It just means with sequence or something that's next in order. So in the same way, what would be the natural next order if we saw someone suffered a horrible consequence of winning $10 million in the lottery? Well, we, must, we could probably conclude then that their conclusions that they had were probably thinking that they probably knew that they, can, that they had a good chance of winning. If they didn't believe they had a good chance of actually winning the lottery, they probably wouldn't have played it in the first place. So just by simply seeing again these different kinds of consequences, that we can usually use that information to, to help guide us to what the conclusions probably were for those people. Now, we have to be careful we're doing this though. We don't want to let this lead us to, uh, to prejudice for people and make some presumptions about what everyone's concluding simply because of looking at their outward actions, behavior, consequences. But what I want to illustrate here is just that the fact that we can see these external layers can give us some reasonable assumptions and we can come to re some, some reasonable conclusions about what a person was probably deciding or concluding that eventually led to those actions, behaviors, or consequences that we can see. So next we might say that the conclusions or decisions that we make are formed from our beliefs. This is again moving backwards within the ABC model. So if again we use this illustration of the three-story building that's being constructed, we might say this part of the conclusions, which serves as the foundation for these things that we're, we're taking actions, behaviors on, and suffering consequences from, we might ask ourselves what are the materials or the beliefs that we're using to form that foundation. So there might be some sort of substance that's used to create this foundation where is our solid base for making decisions that eventually lead to the actions and that we're going to be constructing on top of this foundation. So our beliefs can be kind of like concrete. Concrete that is kind of like a mixture of different materials that form the foundation of a building. Well, in the same way, it's like our beliefs are like concrete. They're, they're a mixture of things that help form the foundation. So the mixture of the materials, like beliefs, can either strengthen or weaken our foundation. So we have to be careful what type of material we're using to form this foundation. Because if we're using something that's weak, like a weak belief, something that doesn't have a lot of evidence or not very believable or doesn't have a lot of support or facts to back it up, then it could compromise the foundation we're building our decisions and conclusions on and then cause our whole building to crumble. In the same way, we probably want to have stronger types of beliefs where we have more evidence and more data to back it up. And by doing that, it gives us a stronger foundation for our decisions and conclusions we're making. And therefore, when we take actions, it's built on a stronger foundation. Well, the same way, we need to examine and test those beliefs to make sure that the foundation we're building and all those conclusions aren't compromised in any way and that they wouldn't compromise the structural integrity of our whole building, again, that our actions and behaviors are built upon. So if it goes back to beliefs as forming our foundation, we might wonder, well, what are our beliefs formed from? And beliefs account, I believe, for the uncertainties in life. Now really, no one knows the future with full certainty. No one can admit to that. So our beliefs are kind of like balancing the information we do know with what we don't know so that it can help lead to reasonable conclusions based off of that. So in that way, beliefs are kind of like the balance of how we evaluate risks versus rewards. So here's an illustration of how I want to show that evaluation between risks and rewards and how that influences our beliefs. So let's say we have this scale and the scale represents kind of like our, our level of beliefs. what so we'll call it the belief scale. Well, on one side of the scale, we'll have the rejection of a certain belief. Well, what are the things that help us to reject a certain belief in something? Well, we might have a couple of buckets, again, represented by risks versus rewards. Well, the things that might influence us to reject a belief could include the reward of rejecting it. That is, what are we, what's the, the benefit we have by rejecting a belief in something? And also, what's the risk of accepting it? That is, what's the downside if we were to actually accept and believe in something? What's the risk of that? The risk, if it's negative then, would probably be something that would help us to be more influenced in rejecting that belief. Well, on the opposite side of the scale, we've got the acceptance of a belief. So you might guess the opposite is what's the buckets on that side of the scale, and that is the reward of accepting it. So what do we get? What's the value or benefit we get out of accepting a certain belief? And also, what's the risk of rejecting a belief? So there might be a downside again if we were to reject it, and that downside might be worth enough for us to actually accept a belief in something. So based off of this balance like this, let's walk through a couple of examples. So we might ask yourself, what are the potential risks and rewards using these following statements? Let's first say that we have a proposed statement, I can win the lottery. So we need to decide in ourselves, are we going to believe this statement or not? I'm going, am I going to reject this statement or accept this first statement, believing that we can win the lottery? Well, what's the reward of rejecting it? 
with a reward and we're going to go eat through each of these buckets. The reward of rejecting this statement is that I save my lottery ticket money. I don't spend it. And also the risk of accepting it. If I were to accept this belief, then I might be, the risk is I could be wasting my time and my money in doing that. So these are the things that might influence me to reject this particular statement, reject and believing that statement that I can win the lottery. But on the other side, what's the reward of accepting it? Well, it improves my chance to win. You can't play if you don't win. I'm sorry, you can't win if you don't play. So it improves your chance to win if you were to, to accept it. So that's the value you get from it. And also, if you were to reject it, what's the risk if you were to reject that belief? Well, you could miss out on the chance of actually winning. So again, these are the kinds of things that could influence this other side of the scale that might tip the scale in favor of actually accepting that statement. So let's walk through another example. The proposed statement is, I can text on my smartphone and also drive. I believe that I can do that at the same time. Well, some people are very adamant about believing whether you can or cannot do that. So everyone has, again, a different philosophy whether you're going to allow yourself to text and drive at the same time. So here might be some of the things you might consider of whether we're going to accept or reject a statement like this. So what's the reward of rejecting that statement? Well, the upside of rejecting is that I'm ensuring safety in driving for myself and maybe others on the road. What's the risk if I were to accept it? Well, if I were to accept this statement, after all, it may actually cause an accident, which could be a bad thing. Well, on the other side of the scale, maybe the reward of accepting it. If I were to believe in this statement, then I would at least get undisrupted communication. I can continue to communicate as I normally do, even though I'm in the middle of driving. And the risk if I were to reject the statement, what's the downside? I might miss out on having fast communication, being alerted of something I need, or being able to, to do some critical communication that I think is necessary, even if it's in the middle of my driving. So again, right or wrong, it doesn't matter how we balance each of these. These are the kinds of things that we might use to fill these different buckets. And depending on how we weigh these different types of arguments, the rewards or risks of whether we're going to reject it or accept it, those are the kinds of things that might fall into these buckets and tip the scale in one direction or another, whether we're going to reject or accept a certain belief. So let's dig into that a little bit further. So as we dig deeper, we'll see that the risks and rewards that fill those buckets are really like an argument, an argument that we use as evidence of whether we're going to accept or reject a belief in something. The problem is that not all arguments are actually created equal. So how is it that we can properly compare these different arguments? So each argument should be weighed to account for the different significance they have, like the reward side, or the severity, that is the risk. So as an example, we might compare two extremes, two types of arguments, like ignorance versus facts, and they might have different types of weight for them. So let's say on the lighter side, where we have ignorance, we might say again back to our construction example that it might be represented by styrofoam, something that is a very lightweight material that has no substance at all, something that no right-minded construction worker would ever want to use for forming the foundation of a building. So something that is has got no substance and is very lightweight. Well, this might be represented of ignorance. That is something as a lightweight argument, something that has no tangible or repeatable evidence. Well, that might be one side. And the opposite side of the spectrum could be gold. That is something that is very heavily weighted. And that is, might be represented by truth or like an indisputable fact, something that's a very heavyweight argument, something that has a lot of tangible and repeatable evidence. Now, granted, Gold is not something we would use to build a foundation for a building, but here we're using this as an illustration just to show that it's a very heavy substance. It's very solid and very dense, and in that way is, is something that is strong enough to support the heavy weight of any actions or behaviors that might be built on something like that kind of material. So this is just to illustrate the two extremes here between two types of light versus heavyweight materials, as well as representing a lightweight type of argument, something that's ignorance, versus a very heavyweight argument like truth, something that's an indisputable fact or absolute truth, like two plus two equals four. That's an example of something that is like an absolute truth. So beliefs don't need to be indisputable facts. We don't have to have everything be a gold standard, if you will, or, or be, be absolute truth. All we need is something that's a more heavily weighted argument. So risk is something that's normal, that happens in life, and it's something that we should actually expect. Virtually every decision that we make accounts for some level of risk in what we do. Now, if you've ever seen the movie, What About Bob? It's something that came out uh, at least a couple decades ago. And in the movie, the plot here includes Bill Murray, who's Bob as the character, who's working with his doctor, which is Richard Dreyfuss. And what makes this movie so comical is that Bill Murray plays a character who is not willing to accept any level of risk. 
He's so deathly afraid of danger and so afraid of risk that he'll do whatever he can to protect himself to the point where he won't do anything productive at all because he's afraid of so many risks. The risks he brings up are real risks. They're legitimate. But they're so remote that it's not very possible that those things will actually happen. And what makes this illustration for this movie so funny and so comical is just the fact that no one lives their life that way. Practically, we're all willing to accept some level of risk, and that's acceptable. And that's why this is so funny, because he takes the extreme example of somebody who wouldn't be willing to accept any level of risk whatsoever. So risk for us is really what helps fill the gaps of the evidence towards shaping our beliefs. Again, we don't have to have everything be absolute truth and be like a gold standard for us. But it's okay to have something that's less heavily weighted. And, and for the part that we don't have, it's kind of like that risk we're willing to take to fill the gaps. And that's acceptable for us. All we need is enough heavily weighted arguments, like facts, to reasonably outweigh the opposing arguments. Those are the ways that we would fill it on our belief scale. Again, having enough heavily weighted arguments on one side in order to tip the scale in one direction of whether we're going to accept or reject a certain belief. Well, how is it that we could determine the weight for these different types of arguments we could have? Well, one way is to categorize the arguments into five different groups that I call eye test, from a, going from light to heavy, and we'll go through an illustration of that. Now, these groups that I'm about to show you are not intended to be showing a mutually exclusive set of groups, but just to show a natural progression from something that's lightweight to heavyweight. So let's just say we have this broad spectrum here, and on one side we've got things that are lighter weight, on the opposite side we have things that are heavier weighted. So like the example we've already shown, on the lighter side we've got ignorance that represents nothing, no basis at all, and we use the construction example here of, of using styrofoam as our construction material, something again that's very lightweight. And on the opposite side, as we talked about before, we've got truth that would be on the far heavy side. And this is the example of gold again in our construction example. So what do we have in between here that fills this gap? Well, we have three more that we can show. The next one would be theoretical types of arguments, that is, the things that are based off of assumptions or, or theories or something that seems logical, but nothing that we've actually proven out or can, can actually test or experience. So this might be represented in our construction example of something that's like wood, something that is more substantive than styrofoam, but still not heavily weighted compared to gold. Next to that could be an empirical type of argument. That is something that's based off of experience. It's not just something that we can prove in a classroom or prove logically, but it's something that we can actually see and experience with our senses. Well, this might be something that's like brick. Again, more heavily weighted and something more dense and solid compared to wood or styrofoam, but not quite as dense and solid as gold. And the last example we might use to fill in the gap here is scientific type of argument. That is something that's based off of data. Provable data, something that is valid and measurable, that, that shows that there's clear evidence that we can prove with data to show uh, about whether a, a topic is something that's worth believing or not, or at least helping describe the weight for that argument. On well, this construction example, this might be represented by lead. Again, something that's a lot more solid compared to the other examples, but even lead is not as heavy compared to gold, and it's not as solid compared to gold. In case you weren't aware of that, that is truth, that lead is not as heavy as gold is. So in this way, this might represent, again, a spectrum just to show the progression of going from something that's very lightweight from ignorance to something that's just assumption-based or logical that is theoretical, or something we use with experience that's based off of like an empirical type of argument or maybe scientific argument that does use data or we might have a truth type of argument something that's actually factual well, as we compare the differences between these different weights like this and these different arguments we might say the stuff that's on the lighter side this is the stuff that's intangible but on the opposite side for the heavier weight is something that's absolutely tangible then on the opposite side for the lighter weight this could be something that's not repeatable it only happened it never happens at all it may have happened just once but again not something that is repeatable for us to test however the things that are more heavily weighted will be represented by something that is repeatable something that we can test more often and prove on the opposite side for the lighter weight this is something where there's limited application that is there might be it might not affect everyone at all or there's only limited circum circumstances where that situation would allow for it to occur versus on the heavier weighted side uh, this is something that's universally applicable so in any situation this is something that could apply and then on the opposite side we've got limited accessibility something that's lighter weight again not everyone has access to it so it's not possible for everyone to even see test or or to experience in any way we're on the opposite side for something that's heavier weighted it's universally accessible anyone can access it from any point if they needed to 
On the lighter side, it's something that's more emotion based. That is, because there's not a lot of support for it, that's not a strong evidence, there might be more emotions helping to fill that gap. This might be more likely in these kinds of circumstances compared to the heavier weighted side, you really don't need emotions to prove like a 2 plus 2 equals 4. I don't need something like that to prove it because I don't have to be emotional about it. I might need to be more emotional emotional, in comparing something like 2 plus 2 equals 5 because I don't have much evidence to prove that that's true. And because of that, I might need more emotions to convince my audience and have them believe me. But when it's something that is easily accessible and, and applicable and repeatable and tangible, I can show that I don't really need enough emotions to prove 2 plus 2 equals 4. Another example is less confidence on the lighter weight side. Because there's not a lot of evidence to prove it, we might be less confident of whether we're going to believe that argument or not versus something on the heavier side might be something that's more confidence. We have a lot more confidence than usual because it is something that is more heavily weighted. So again, if we use an example of 2 plus 2 equals 4, that's something that is tangible, repeatable, universally applicable. It could apply in any situation. We can see 2 plus 2 will always equal 4. Universally accessible, doesn't matter who you are within the world or whatever part of time you might have lived in, 2 plus 2 is always equal to, going to equal 4. I don't need to be emotional about it, and I can be very confident in it. Compared to something that is lighter weight, I would have something that's lot not tangible, it's not something repeatable, it's less applicable, not as accessible. I might fill it up with more emotions myself to argue the, the case for that, as well as be less confident. So what we want to ask ourselves is a couple things. First off, what are the types of weights that I'm actually using for my arguments? When I want to believe in something, what are the arguments I'm using and what's the weight for those arguments I'm using to influence my beliefs? And then how can I make those things heavier? If I find myself having things that are more lightweight, I'm basing it off of maybe logic. And maybe it's good logic. But if it's something that hasn't been experienced or maybe has hard data to back it up, then what can I do to give it heavier weight so I can have more confidence in the decision I'm making or more confidence in the actions and behaviors that eventually are built on that foundation of my beliefs and conclusions? So how do we test these different arguments and try to balance them again back in our belief scale? Well, we can test each one independently and use the following methods and questions to help evaluate the type of weight we might adapt to each of these different arguments. First of all, ask ourselves, is the argument an absolute truth based on indisputable facts? Well, that might, might feel like it's true. Emotionally, I might want to believe in something, but let's ask ourselves a few questions just to validate that for sure, according to how we define it in this ABC model. First off, is the argument verifiable with our human senses? That is, is it something that's tangible? And is the argument repeatable with consistent results? Is the argument universally applicable to and universally accessible by anyone? And if we answer no to any of those questions, then chances are it's not an indisputable fact or absolute truth. There actually aren't too many things that would fall into that kind of category. And you know that's okay. Again, I don't have to have everything be an indisputable fact or absolute truth. So it's something that's a little bit lesser in the scale. So if it doesn't fit in that type of category, then let's evaluate from the next level. That is, is the argument based on scientific or statistical data that's been tested? Well, if it hasn't, then we need to ask ourselves, is the argument based on real life experience? Even though we haven't scientifically tested it, is it at least based off of some sort of real life experience? If not, then we might ask ourselves, is the argument based on logical assumptions? Even though we might have experienced it yet, does it seem to be logical or maybe theoretical in nature where we might believe it? If it's not that, then chances are it's something that's much lighter weight, something that would be more like ignorance. So the weighted arguments can be applied again back to the respective risk or reward that we have in our scale. So if we again look at the collection of all the different arguments that we have, because chances are we don't have one thing that tips our scale in one direction or another. It's usually a combination of things. And they're all those combination of things are all those different arguments that might have different weights. And those different weights are going to influence us and in whether we're going to accept or reject a belief in something. So again, if we look at our, our different um, the different categories we have, where we're going from something that's more ignorant, that's lightweight, versus something that's truth-based, that's very heavily weighted, we would use this to adapt it to our belief scale. We're in the belief scale, again, we can have, we, we would evaluate each of these different items as like different arguments. And the only difference here in the example is that we have better arguments or more heavily weighted arguments on one side that might tip the scale to actually accept a certain belief in something. Now we can still have some weak arguments, like we're showing here, styrofoam. 
or even maybe the wood or the brick that tend to be things that's more based off of ignorance or theoretical or empirical and that's okay because we just tend to have more heavily weighted things like maybe there are there are some things that are based on absolute truth or something that's more scientific that would tip the scale in this direction on the opposite side we do still have some good arguments even here we show an example of something that's a lead weight there is some data to back it up and there are some other ones that might be more empirical based off of our experience but the thing is as we're showing in this illustration it's not that we don't have a good case on the opposite side in order to reject a belief it just is that we have more heavily weighted arguments on the opposite side. So in this example, if we have better evidence, more heavily weighted evidence on one side of the scale, then we might be more inclined to accept a belief in something versus rejecting it. And we might find the reverse. We might have better evidence on the rejection side. If that's the case, then that's probably what's going to tip our scale on whether we're going to believe in something or not. Okay, this may be sounding a bit complex at this point, but let's stretch this construction example just a little bit further before we tie it all back together. All right, so as we stretch this example a little bit further at the end here, we wanna ask ourselves, what are the sources for our arguments? Where are we getting our information from in the first place? So truth, like an indisputable fact or absolute truth, can come from almost any source. It could even come from an unreliable source. So if we consider a source to be unreliable, are we automatically disregarding their information even if it's a, fa if it's a fact? That is, we might consider something to be an unreliable source, like we use the example very often of, well, I know it must be true because I, I read it on the internet. Well, obviously, we, that's comical because we know we can't believe everything on the internet. But that doesn't mean we disregard everything on the internet just because we can't believe everything that's on the internet. We still have to process the information that we're hearing, and we need to be able to distinguish that. We need to objectively separate the information from the source where we're hearing that information in order to discern what is the proper weight. So that way we're saying, yeah, this is coming from a bad source, but it still could be true. So let me make sure I can evaluate the information separate from where the source is coming from from. Well, at the same rate, we might have a very reliable source, but unknowingly, or maybe knowingly, they might actually say something that's not true. So we can't automatically accept it as true just because it's from a reliable source, although we're more inclined to believe it because it's a reliable source. We still have to be able to objectively separate the information from the source where we're getting the information from. And why is it that we find that some people tend to accept all information from any source? There are a lot of people that I know like that, where it doesn't matter who they are or where they read it from, they're going to believe it because they want to believe in it. Just like a, somebody might say that my brother's wife's gardener's hairdresser said it happened to them, so it must be true because they experienced it. Well, that doesn't make it obviously true. So we have to be careful. That's where skepticism, I think, is valuable. Skepticism is like a counterbalance to the information we're getting in order for us to adequately process it or weigh it. So I think skepticism actually could be a good thing because we want to be careful that we're not, we're not accepting everything that's coming in, but we're putting a filter on ourselves ahead of time to make sure we can process inf this information correctly. So if we go back to our example again, where we've got the belief scale and how we're evaluating the different arguments that are feel, filling into the, the belief scale, it's kind of like we have to put a barrier around our belief scale to protect it. And we have some guard in front of it. So then as the information comes into us from these different sources, we're evaluating it ahead of time, carefully making sure that we're considering the source where the information is coming from. And then we need to process that information. And we need to process it according to the different scale of, of whether the type of weight, of whether it's a lightweight or something all the way up to extremely heavy, heavily weighted to make sure that as we assess that information, we give it the due type of, of application that it needs, whether it's a reward or a risk based off of whether it's going to go on the rejection side of the scale or the acceptance side of the scale. Again, what we're looking for is more heavily weighted items on one side that will tip the scale in one direction or another to influence of whether we're going to reject or accept a certain belief. Now that we've gone through each of the different parts, let's pull it all together into the full ABC model. Now I'll revisit again the overview that we originally looked at for the ABC model now that we've gotten through the entire construction example to see how we adapt it here. So we started off in looking at asking ourselves what behaviors and consequences may our actions lead to. And then from there, well, how do our conclusions influence our actions, if at all? The conclusions, again, being the foundation that all of our actions are built on. And then next, how do all of our beliefs and influence our conclusions and the decisions we're making, the things that form the foundation? And then next, how are all the arguments balanced to form our different beliefs, whether we're going to believe something or reject the belief in something? 
And then how are we evaluating the information to build an argument, that is to understand the weight of the argument and assess it. And then finally, the last thing we covered was where are we getting our source information, where is it coming from. And this represents the order where it starts with our information coming into us, how we're processing it, how it's affecting whether we're going to believe in something or not, how we allow those beliefs to form our conclusions and decisions on which we build the foundation for our actions, behaviors, and consequences. This is the illustration of the entire ABC model, but let's take this a little bit further and start to adapt it in several ways to see how we can make sense of it and apply it to real life. So now that we've gone over the entire ABC model in theory, let's apply the model using an astronomical example. The example I want to illustrate here is the battle over the geocentric and the heliocentric models. What a way to impress your friends at dinner parties when you can explain what the geocentric and heliocentric models are. So what do I mean by all this? Well today we widely accept that the Earth and the planets revolve around our Sun and our solar system which reflects the heliocentric model instead of the Sun and planets revolving around the Earth which is the geocentric model. So here are illustrations of each one. Again, the geocentric model meaning the, the old school way of believing that the Earth was the center of our solar system and all the, the planets and sun revolved around the Earth versus the heliocentric model where the sun is at the center and that everything else within our solar system revolves around that. So in this example, it was actually the heliocentric model that was discovered by Copernicus and later defended strongly by Galileo. And this stood in the face of the geocentric model that was supported so long by Aristotle, Ptolemy, and many others for thousands of years. So it was such a, a different way of thinking through things that they actually were persecuted strongly for having even believed in something different like this heliocentric model. So let's explore though the arguments used by each side of those who believed in one argument or the other. So the geocentric supporters, they appeared to have more fact-based type of evidence. Fact-based as defined by this ABC model. That is, the movement of the sun and the planets appear tangibly. That is, we can visually confirm with our eyes that the sun, the moon, and all the planets and stars seem to be revolving around the earth. And the movement is also repeatable. It happens every single day. We can see this evidence occurring. It's also universally applicable and accessible. Anyone at any point on Earth can see that all these things are revolving around the Earth. It seems so obvious. However, the heliocentric supporters have more scientific type of evidence. Scientific, again, back to our scale, was that level that was just below what we call the fact. So it wasn't as strong as being fact-based, but it was still considered to be strong at a scientific level. So even though the geocentric model appears to be factual based off of how we're defining the ABC model, I would actually argue that neither model is factual. That's true. I said that. That I believe neither of these models are actually factual in the way that we define the terms fact within the ABC model. Now what do I mean by that? Before you start going and saying that I don't believe that, that the earth revolves around the sun and, or anything like that, what I'm saying is that for the true factual perspective for how we're defining a fact within the ABC model, in order to, to do that and prove that out truly is to observe the model from a fixed point in space for an extended period of time, similar to the illustration that's shown in each of these models. In order to actually see this and prove it tangibly like this and watch it repeatedly, and make it accessible like that, you'd have to stand out in space at a point like this and observe the movement. Well, no one in our capability now for technology is able to do that. So what appears to be tangible evidence for those who supported the geocentric model is actually probably more empirical. That is, from the perspective of where they are on Earth, it appears in their experience that all those things are revolving around the Earth when that's not really the case. So they were actually taking the wrong perspective. They were making an assumption, and the assumption was that from their perspective, everything was revolving around them, when really they had the wrong perspective. The better perspective would have been to stand outside in space at a fixed point for an extended period of time to really prove that it's true. So in this case, when we compare it with the heliocentric model, the heliocentric model, again, has more of the mathematical and scientific type of data, which would, in that case, outweigh the geocentric model, which we call empirical. So we go back to the ABC model scale again, and we're showing that the geocentric model, what we thought might have been factual, was actually more empirical, which is lower on the scale as far as having a heavier weight, more heavily weighted argument, compared to the heliocentric model. So does that mean that the heliocentric model is actually wrong, or it could be wrong? Well, I'm not saying that. All I'm saying is that we don't have 
tangible fact-based evidence according to how we define the fact-based evidence in this ABC model. We don't have enough of that evidence in order to make that kind of conclusion. But you know what? The evidence we do have is sufficient. In other words, I don't need, again, as I said earlier, everything to be absolute truth or an indisputable fact in order to live my life successfully. I don't have to have that to be an absolute fact in my life in order to, to continue to be successful and move on and make decisions and take actions. I'm, I'm more than willing to take the risk that I could be wrong and believe in the heliocentric model. Now for someone who works for NASA, someone who's working out and doing astronomical type of work, they probably have a little more risk involved because a lot of the things they're doing are based off of the assumptions here about the heliocentric model being true. Again, I might be able to say with very strong conviction that I do believe in heliocentric model. But according to how we define an ABC model, I just want to clearly say that I don't think you can prove either model to be absolutely true. And I think that I don't think anyone actually could unless you could stand out in space for an extended period of time, again, according to how we define it within the ABC model. But that's okay. Emotionally, I can still live like it's absolutely true. And I can still make all the decisions as if it's absolutely true. But when push comes to shove and I'm cornered and I have to defend it in some way, I'm willing to say, you know what? The evidence that we do have seems to much more strongly convince me that the heliocentric model is what's true. Am I 100% confident of that? Well, emotionally I am, and I can make my act, take actions and make my decisions based off of it. However, if I were to actually prove it in a court of law, I don't have strong enough evidence to say it with 100% conviction. But you know what? The evidence I do have, maybe 98% conviction, and that's good enough for me. Or if you compare it to like a, a court of law, we might say we have proof beyond a reasonable doubt. Well, in this case, I don't have 100% proof. Just like in, the, in a court case, we don't necessarily have to have actual videotape evidence of a, a crime happening in order to convict somebody. We, we rarely have it occurring. When we have it, that's great. That seems to be a fact. And even sometimes that's still disputed about the motivations or the interpretation of what's happening on the video camera. But the point is, we don't have to have that in order to convict something, convict a person of a crime or to prove that something is true or not true. Well, in the same way, all we need is enough evidence to prove beyond a reasonable doubt. And that's all I'm saying here that there's strong enough evidence for me to believe beyond a reasonable doubt that I would adopt the heliocentric model. But I don't have 100% evidence, and that's okay. I can still live my life successfully without having to have that level of conviction. Hopefully that example shows how we can apply the model using basic astronomical concepts that we normally take for granted. But let's explore it further to see how the ABC model can be used in a more current and relevant situation that we face. How can we practically apply this kind of ABC model to our jobs and make it relevant to us today? Well, I think there are four different perspectives we can go over to help illustrate that. First is evaluating adverse consequences. For example, adverse consequences that may come from not identifying risks or maybe having too many lightweight arguments. So as an example, finding unexpected results or maybe more defects after we're piloting improvements to a process. So that is, we might have some sort of improvement we want to put in place, then we go through the process of trying to pilot it, to test it out, but we're getting unexpected results, something we didn't account for or didn't expect. The improvement is not leading to the, the type of improvement we expected, or maybe it's some sort of adverse effects. So we might need to ask ourselves, what risks were not considered or properly evaluated that could have prevented the consequence in the first place? And what assumptions were used for finding the root cause and improving the process? That is, maybe there was something that we considered to be a heavier weight argument that was really a lighter weight argument. Maybe we made some assumptions there. So if we're obviously not getting the results we expected, then that means we didn't account for something. So even though we might get adverse effects or consequences from something like a pilot or something occurring, that's a good opportunity to go back and see where do we make a, a wrong judgment about something? Or where do we treat something as a higher weight or heavier weighted argument than what it really is? Another example is evaluating the, the weight of our own arguments. So we might ask ourselves, what weight do we apply to our arguments or what risks haven't we considered in our own assessment? So, if, for example, if we're doing a root cause analysis, like in the analyze phase or the improve phase of a DMAIC methodology, we might ask ourselves, are there other statistical tests that can further prove or disprove our conclusions? And do we need more data samples to become more confident in the test results? Now what I like to illustrate normally when you go through some of these statistical tests is that you might find a test that actually validates some of the, the conclusions that you've had. But that doesn't mean that you did the test correctly or that you're interpreting the results correctly. 
So the point is, depending on your audience and the type of argument in case you're trying to build for that particular project and whatever changes you want to implement, you might need to go back and apply some additional statistical tests just to make sure that you didn't make any wrong assumptions somewhere. Just to make sure that you haven't missed a, a gap in some way in how you did your analysis, the, the representation of the data that you're using, how you're interpreting the results of the test and that sort of thing. So you might want to go back and if this is an important enough issue, you might need to reevaluate it, get more samples or apply the statistical test and maybe different perspectives to help support that and validate it because it's a win-win. If you find you go through those tests and go through the extra work and it just further validates what you have, then that's just adding more weight to your argument. And that would mean that you're adding more heavily weighted arguments that eventually will influence your audience in order to agree that, yes, this is something we want to sponsor. We want to sponsor this improvement and it's the right improvement we want to make. However, I said it's win-win because if you find that by doing this, you find conflicting information, then that's good. You stopped yourself from actually making a mistake of coming to the wrong conclusion. So you need to go back and what you thought might have been a root cause, maybe it isn't root cause after all. So it's a good point at least that you caught yourself in that. A third example is trying to build arguments to influence your audience. So if you know your audience is improperly weighting their arguments that they're using to influence their belief scale in their mind, then you can either challenge their weighting that they're using or maybe add arguments that maybe they haven't considered at all. So a real world example that I've had in my past is that there's an executive who is ready to eliminate a an entire department because they thought the performance for that department was low. So a few things we ask ourselves is, well, how is that executive measuring the performance for that department? And how are the metric targets being set for them? And are there assumptions the executive is making about the process when they're benchmarking to similar processes? Well, what we found is, in that executive's mind, they came to the conclusion performance is low and they're ready to take the action based off of that conclusion, they're ready to take the next action of eliminating the department. But what we found is they were actually using wrong information. They had bad data and were coming to the wrong conclusions. So what we found is the benchmarking that they were doing was an invalid benchmarking. They were comparing apples and oranges and the performance and the types of transactions that were handling in these two different departments they were comparing. So when we got it balanced to a true apples to apples comparison between the two departments, what we found is actually they're performing exactly the same. There was no difference in their performance, they're performing just as well. So they just happened to be getting more difficult transactions that made it look like their performance was actually worse than the department they're being compared to. So in that case, by presenting that information back to the executive to show that it wasn't a fair comparison, and actually when we did a fair comparison, the performance was fine, they did not eliminate the department after all. So it's that kind of thing, where we can understand our audience. What are they using in their decision process? How they're allowing things to influence their beliefs. If we can understand that, then that would help us to, to understand what type of additional arguments we need to come up with to influence them. Another example of this could be, uh, who is the type of audience that you're trying to, to communicate to? Is this uh, some leaders, for example, love to have strong evidence and maybe they're slow to make any decisions. They're not willing to make a decision unless they have very substantial evidence to prove one thing or another. Well, knowing that up front is good to know because that way you can know that you need to go back and get strong evidence with a lot of data to back it up because you know that's the type of audience you need to communicate to. And if you come in with weak arguments, they're probably not going to buy into it and you're not going to get the sponsorship you need. Likewise, you might have a leader who, who's willing to take action at anything. So you might have to be very careful. You may not need a whole lot of evidence, although you need to be confident that the evidence you're presenting is accurate, but you might not need to go through all the extra work of, of doing a whole lot of analysis on something if there's someone who's easily influenced and ready to take action. So just being aware of your audience and how they process this information, like again, based off of the ABC model, can help you in how you're preparing to communicate with them. The last example is it's a way for us to build a case that where we can challenge an opponent or maybe disarm the opponent. So this is where we can look for emotions that might be coming across in our opponent that could be disguising lightweight arguments as heavyweight arguments. So one example is if there's an opponent who may be someone who's, who's conflicting with something you're proposing and they are strongly and adamantly opposing what, what you're proposing, then that opponent might state something as a fact. Well then what you might want to do is challenge what they're calling a fact by using the method that we've, of how we define a fact in the ABC model. So if somebody says, well we know this is always the case, and they're considering it to be factual, we already know this as a fact, well then you can test them really. Is that something that we have 
hard data to back up? Is this something that's tangible? Is this something repeatable, universally applicable or accessible? That kind of thing we can ask them. Chances are it's not. And if it's not, then your opponent is going to back down in some way. Maybe not, not back down fully, but just the very fact they might have to, to step backwards and say, well, you know, in most cases this occurs. Just the very fact of them backing down like that gives you a little bit of extra ground, a little bit of edge in how you're influencing your audience. Another example is, if your argument is not a fact, you're the one presenting it out, then be careful that you're not treating it like a fact. So that way, your opponent isn't going to easily challenge you in the same way that I just said you can challenge them. So you have to keep your own emotions at bay. That is, making sure that you're communicating any potential risks and you're using more tentative type of language. And by doing that, you're disarming your opponent. That is, you're not giving them any ammunition against you to challenge you and it also raises your credibility. So as an example, when you propose something, you could say, well, from the data we collected, it appears like this is the case. Just by saying it appears like this is the case is more tentative than to say this is the case because you're coming across as if it's factual. So I would just say try to be more careful in how you communicate that so you don't come across as being more factual than you intend because it could be used against you. All right, before we close this lesson, let's discuss how we can apply some of these concepts in a practical way. I'd like you to think of a few projects you might have worked on in the past and ask yourself a few questions. First of all, what were some of the challenges or obstacles that you might have had in getting buy-in from the key stakeholders for that project? And what were some of the arguments that they used to challenge your position? And how would you weigh their arguments according to that scale of evidence, again, of, of showing the ignorance all the way up to truth, like the example of styrofoam all the way up to the gold standard? And how would you weigh your own arguments in comparison? Did you present your arguments fairly to them? And also, how could their arguments have been peacefully challenged in order to persuade them to change? Well, that wraps up this lesson. Check out statstuff.com for many more resources that can help you achieve powerful results. I'm Matt Hansen. Thanks for watching.